One of the themes of this book <laughs> is that there's a difference between the idea of Superman, which exists in the cultural ether, which per pervades the air around us and has become part of the collective consciousness of the planet, and the character of Superman. So uh, for people like my sweet silverhead Aunt Faye, there's the idea of Superman, the guy in the cape, the guy in the tights, he, he fights for what's right. For nerds like me, there's the character of Superman who has been endlessly iterated and, and rebooted and retconned over the years in many different media. So that's kind of what I wanted to, to get at today. So let's start uh, by, I, I'll call on you. you. You tell me a thing you know about Superman. Uh, Kryptonite was introduced not in the comic, but on the radio show. Uh, it was written uh, by Jerry Siegel. He, he wanted to write about Kryptonite. He wanted to uh, have a story with Kryptonite in it, but uh, the, the editors at DC told him that the story he had written, in which Superman reveals his secret identity to Lois Lane, didn't fly. So in the story, Kryptonite not only takes away Superman's powers, but it gives his powers to somebody else who stand, happens to be st standing next to him. Uh, so in this case, I think it gave it to some criminals, which wouldn't fly. Uh, and the, the, the function of, of kryptonite was not only that it was the one thing that could weaken him, but it also told him who he was. Since the beginning of the very first comic book, the reader knew where he came from, but Superman, the character, did not. So kryptonite was the thing that revealed to him he kept having visions of, uh, of an old place, and that's how he found out he was from another planet, namely uh, kryptonite, uh, Krypton. Uh, so yeah, so if you want to unpack it for a bit, there's a lot to unpack, because these characters, Superman included, are, are symbols. And uh, the symbology of kryptonite is, you could, you could read it many different ways. You could say that kryptonite is a chunk of the past that can hurt you. So if you want to see it as survivor guilt, that's, that's one interpretation. If you want to see it as a particularly toxic form of nostalgia, when we obsess on the past, we risk killing the present. You can also do that. So we'll break out into breakout sessions here, and we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll get some whiteboard. Uh, that was something that was a part of him in the very early going. Over and over again, writing this book, I found that a lot of the stuff that people came up to me when they say Super, Superman is X, Y, and Z is of relatively recent vintage. And a lot of the stuff that we now associate with him accrued later. The, the really basic stuff, the, well, to get to your point about being a crusader, he was essentially a, a progressive hero. He was a social activist. Uh, if he had an agenda at all, it was a very progressive one. He, who did he go after? He, would, he went after people we would now call the 1%. Uh, he went after uh, corporate, uh, corporate fat cats. He went after crooked politicians. He went after manufacturers who, who made poor goods that could hurt people. Uh, he went after uh, um, crooked stockbrokers, that kind of thing. Yeah, go ahead. Exactly, exactly. So you have to think about it. Uh, he didn't fly. He didn't see through time. He, didn't, he couldn't bash uh, a planet with his head and, and pulverize it. Uh, back then. He was just a strong guy in a monkey suit. Uh, a really powerful guy who would be dropped by Siegel and Schuster into a, a, a mundane situation, a bank robbery, or uh, again, somebody, um, uh, he would crusade against reckless driving, for example. Uh, and the, the comedy of the, of, the, of the stories, the action of the stories, came from this disconnect between here is this uh, guy in, in, a, in a, basically a circus outfit, who can do really powerful things. That's it, that was the length, that was the entire uh, structure of those stories early going. So one of the things I do in the book is I take a look at those first 12 stories, and they're 13 page stories, there's not much, but that's the thing that the entire country was sort of uh, really getting really excited about. It's the reason why kids went into the uh, stores and said, sell me the comic with Superman in it, because there was something about it. And in, those, in the early going, there's a lot of stuff in there that didn't make it. 75 years later. He had a power back then where he could contort the muscles of his face and disguise himself as somebody else. But the stuff that stuck around was the stuff that fits the name, Superman. He's not pretty good man, he's not slightly better than average man, Superman. So his, the, his shtick is he's like us only better, bigger, more powerful. So the, the stuff that stuck around is he's like us but stronger. 
he can see farther. He can hear from uh, greater distances away. The stuff that didn't stick around is he can contort the muscles of his face. <laughs> because that's the province of a villain. It's a thing a villain would do is go undercover. And in those early stories, he was going undercover all the time for no reason except it was kind of cool. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so that's, that's a thing that uh, certainly, and, and his role as a newspaper man was, was back, back in the day, it was, he was, a, he was a, a straight up Joe. I mean, the front page and, and, and that, that whole uh, notion of a great metropolitan newspaper really informed the characterization of Lois Lane, but also uh, his job as a, as a newspaper guy. The cape came from his, his origins on the page. Because what you can do, what Siegel was very good at doing, was drawing very dynamic action, but you couldn't convey speed. You could throw some speed lines, but that sort of iconography hadn't really gelled quite yet. So what you want, and the very first image of Superman, which I talk about in the book, uh, that we actually see him in action, is of him at the height of his leap, because again, he could only leap an eighth of a mile at this time, uh, with, and he's kind of in a hurdler's stance with his, uh, his leg tucked under his butt and the other leg shoved out like, he's, like it's a plane. And the thing that is uh, telling us how fast he's going is the cape. Uh, when, as soon as we get uh, the radio show, as soon as we get the Fleischer animated shorts, which are still some of the best Superman there is in the world, uh, you see this, this, this idea of somebody leaping around in action. And initially, it looks dumb, because he's leaping an eighth of a mile. He's like a flea in a cape. <laughs> he's just bouncing around. So the makers of the Fleischer shorts went to DC, went to Siegel and & Schuster and their editors, and said, can we look at this a little bit? Huh? Sort of maybe turn up the volume on this just a little bit. And uh, it was already happening on the radio show. If you listen to the very first introduction on the radio show, you hear the introduction. And underneath it, you hear wind noise. Now again, Superman was just leaping at this time, but that wind noise kind of uh, clicked. And that was how we got, we went from leaping an eighth of a mile. Now why an eighth of a mile? Uh, well, uh, at the time, in, in many metropolitan uh, centers, including uh, the cities of Chicago and Cleveland, an eighth of a mile is the measure of an exact city block, exactly. Now, coincidence, I don't know. Pretty cool though. Originally, he fought a never-ending battle, in, in, again, in the 30s when he first started out, he fought a never-ending battle for truth and justice, period. Then, World War II, and then it became truth, justice, and the American way. Added on the radio show. The radio show was what added that in. The radio show created a lot of stuff that has become part of the myth, and that was one of them. Uh, and uh, again, you see this happen. In those first two years of his life, he's kind of a jerk. He's kind of a bully. He's a bully to bullies. He beats up people who would uh, step on the rights of the honest American working man. But he was pretty uh, rough about it. He was kind of a, what we now call snarky. He, was, he, he, he made fun of people with a smirk. Uh, and, uh, and, and he, but all of that went away. He would threaten people, with, by, uh, he would threaten people saying, I'm going to wrap this iron around your neck if you don't X, Y, and Z. Kind of a bully. But as soon as World War II hit, all of his hard edges got worn away because now he can't attack the status quo. He has to defend it. He has to then represent it. So when World War II started, he was a children's comic book character. But by the end, he was an American icon. And a lot of that work was done on the cover of, um, of, of the comic books. A lot of patriotic imagery, a lot of flags. You can see many, many images of the flag kind of melding with his cape, then becoming one synonymous thing. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, so the American way gets back in there, but as soon as World War II ends, it becomes truth and justice once again. And on the radio show, in fact, he starts fighting for racial tolerance because they were injecting a, uh, they were injecting a message of uh, racial tolerance into it. And it became a much more preachy show. Let's not, let, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't disguise the fact that it became a much more sort of uh, moralistic preachy show, but it was coming from a really great place. And so there's a, there's a book called Superman vs. the KKK, which is about that period of time on the radio show uh, and, and the 
uh, and, and this crusade where he becomes a champion of, of racial tolerance. Then uh, it, the American way comes back in right around the Cold War when we need it, and then it, on, the, on the television show, of course, it comes back in, and that's one of the reasons it's stuck around. But then it goes away again in the 60s and 70s. You don't hear too much of that American way stuff, and then it comes back around uh, you know, in the movie, in the 1978 film, it is played as a joke. Um, if you if you fight for truth, justice, in the American way, you'll have you'll be uh, I can't remember the line per se, but it's something like you'll have every politician in Washington against you. <laughs> so the Clark Kent identity uh, was originally conceived as, uh, as as a way for him to disguise himself. So Superman is the real guy. Clark Kent is the Dodge. Clark Kent is this thing that he puts on to uh, distract attention away from his super feats until 1986. And then they decided to reverse it with having Superman be this public persona that Clark Kent, salt of the earth Clark Kent from Smallville, Kansas, uh, adopts. So that was a major inversion and it tweaked something. But uh, in, the, in 1978, the same year that the film came out, they decided they would answer the question, uh, how does yeah, how does Superman fool everyone just by putting on a pair of glasses, including Lois? <laughs> this was an era when they decided that they wanted to start explaining a lot of the stuff that, in, in my opinion, doesn't need explaining because it's a base principle. You know, there's a run of books now uh, called The Physics of X. The Physics of Superheroes is a book you'll see uh, every now and again, which starts, every chapter starts with, could Superman really fly? Then 17 pages of formulas. <laughs> and then it ends with, mm, nope, <laughs> really couldn't. I mean, the book could just be called, shh, you know, because that's, that's what you get at every, at, with, it, with every chapter. And of course he can't. That's the idea. These characters come from the same places that fairy tales come from, the, a place of wish fulfillment. That's what it's about. So this notion that we needed, because what was happening was the fan base was growing older, and they wanted answers, and they wanted things pinned to the specimen board. Why exactly? So at this point, in this story called The Master Mesmerizer of Metropolis, Superman, and I will read this very briefly, looks into the mirror because he's had a dream. He's had a dream that he was, at Clark, at, he was Clark Kent at the Daily Planet. Lana Lang came up to him and said, you should go off and fly and save people. What are you doing hanging around dressed as Clark? So that woke him, and he, he uh, puts the Man of Steel in a literary refle literally reflective mood as he gazes into his bedroom mirror. Is my Clark Kent disguise really that bad? <laughs> Even if I do change my voice slightly when I pose as Clark, can my dual identity really be that easy to see through? And he brushes back his forelock, puts on his glasses. Hmm, now that I stop to think about it, that's the dumbest disguise I've ever seen. <laughs> what am I supposed to look like, a totally different person? Uh-uh, Superman wearing glasses is what I look like. But what should I expect? Ordinary people start wearing glasses. Do their friends say, who are you? No. <laughs> they say, oh, you've got glasses. <laughs> who was I trying to kid when I dreamed up that ridiculous disguise? So it turns out uh, that Superman's power of super hypnotism, which came along a little bit later. Things like super hypnotism, super ventriloquism, that's the Silver Age the magical, silly, goofy time of the Silver Age. Some of my, my favorite era of Superman stories, but that's when introduced. So apparently my power of super hypnotism is always working at low power. Even when I'm not willing it, it automatically projects my subconscious desire to be seen as a weaker and frailer man than I really am. Some, this is my favorite. Some <laughs> unknown property of the Kryptonian plexiglass in my eyeglasses <laughs> must intensify the low-level effect of my eye. So when people look at Clark, what they see is the image of Clark I try to project. So there you go, that's the answer. <laughs> um, this this uh, is an era where we are trying to explain things that don't need explanation. We're trying to justify things that don't need justification. I call it vivisecting the unicorn. You take <laughs> this whimsical conceit and you want to just pick it apart, it's like asking why do strawberries taste good? Well, there's an answer, it's a boring one, but there's an answer. So it, it, it strikes me as a, a, a pointless exercise, but it will become the dominant mode of comic book fandom for several years, and it's still hanging around.
he can fly. Well, as I, as I mentioned, yes, he can fly, uh, but he started out just bouncing around. Um, and it, this is a thing that happens over the course of the years, and you see it happening starting in World War II, but it keeps going on and on. Uh, power creep. He just gets more and more and more powerful. Uh, and, it, and in the 50s and 60s, it becomes so difficult to start writing stories about this guy because he can do literally anything that the focus starts to shift away onto Lois, onto Jimmy, onto Perry, onto Lori Lemuris, the mermaid. Long story. Uh, <laughs> onto Crypto, the super dog, and Streaky, the super cat, and Comet, the super horse, and Beppo, the super monkey. Uh, yeah, so, so yes, he can fly, and, and gra with, within about 10 years, he was able to fly, and fly faster than the speed of light, and when he flies faster than the speed of light, he goes through time, which opens up whole new stories of Superman going back to the past, uh, meeting people from the future. Uh, so yes, he can fly, but not always. Originally, it was basically, if you go back and read Action Comics number one, it's a triangle, but the color is so, it, the, the, tech, the, the, the detail is so fuzzy that you can't really make out the S. You can see it in, the, in one image, but the rest of the time it's just a, it's a yellow upside down triangle. Uh, then it slowly becomes an S. For a while there, especially in the, in the Fleischer animated shorts, it's with a black background. Uh, the very first actor to portray Superman was a guy by the name of Ray Middleton, and he played him at the 1940 World's Fair. It was the first time anybody had dressed up as Superman. And uh, you can see pictures of this dude online. Uh, he does not fit the suit. Uh, <laughs> he is a tall, lanky gentleman uh, who has a lot of padding. And he, he just spends the entire time just posing like this, flexing as much as he can. Uh, he's wearing a big red diaper. And he's wearing um, a, a sign on his chest that reads Superman, which, I mean, come on. That's clearly non-canonical, um, with an S underneath it. So it kind of, do you, you guys remember Ben Cooper Halloween costumes? Ben Cooper Halloween costumes were these vinyl costumes with a plastic mask, and they would have a picture of the character that you were on the chest. Same philosophy, same wrong-headed thinking behind that. But it did evolve, and it, it continues to evolve, and, and it, uh, it, it changes uh, shape, and it... The, the, design, uh, uh, the design aesthetic of the age kind of picks it up and puts it down. Uh, it, it will continue to evolve because if you, if you, th there's an infographic that I saw recently that's basically just here's how they looked uh, through the years. You can see big changes, small changes, but uh, it is, it's, it's like everything else about this character. It's in a constant state of flux that we don't notice because he's so omnipresent. He's been around for so long, and we think we know exact everything about him. But, uh, but in fact, everything we think we know uh, is something that is part of an ongoing process. <laughs>